Again, we'll uh, just find a good meditation posture, one that works for you. Again, keeping the body somewhat upright and straight so that you have a nice uh, sort of attentive quality, but also relaxing into this posture as best as you can so that uh, stress in the body or tension doesn't become an obstacle. Sometimes it's useful even to take a few deep breaths, kind of when you breathe in, feel the whole body expand, even every cell of the body, imagine it expanding. And then as you uh, exhale, just feel everything just naturally contracting and any stress or tension going out with the exhalation. So again, we're mostly going to work with silent meditation. And so to do that, it's good to have an object to focus on. And generally, I encourage people just to work with the breath. Since the breath is with us all the time, you can certainly, if you are working with another object in your practice, uh, thought or visualization or what have you, you're welcome to do that. But for most of us, we'll just stay with the breath. And again, there are a variety of ways to work with the breath. The one that I generally suggest is working with the sensation in the area of the nostrils where we feel the air coming in and out. There's a very subtle sensation in that area. It's sort of a nice one to tune into. But if you have another point or another way of working with the breath that you prefer, you certainly can do that. So maybe before we begin our actual meditation on the breath, one thing that's useful I find is to do a little bit of sort of clearing of the mind a bit. And we'll do this today by using this uh, nine round breathing meditation. And some of you may know this meditation, but if not, I'll guide you through it. It does involve a little bit of a visualization that's according to the tantric teachings. There's said to be three channels that are the primary parts of our practice. These channels are sort of like energy uh, pathways. And so the first one that we imagine is the central channel and it begins just above the nose at that point between the eyebrows and it kind of curls up like the handle of an umbrella. And then when it gets to the crown of the head, that channel goes straight down to a few finger widths below your navel. You can think about it being like a straw, you know, hollow tube. And you can think of that one in particular of being kind of deep blue in color. And it's a little bit larger than the other two that we're going to visualize. The other two are the right and left channels and they begin on the right and left side respectively, just inside the nostrils on the other side, either side of the central channel. The right is red, the left is white, and these two straws or tubes come up to the crown of the head as well and descend down parallel to the central channel. And when they get to the bottom where the central channel is, they kind of curl around a bit so that they kind of create an ability to flow into each other or into the central channel. So just take a moment to do that visualization. Again, the central blue channel, it's a little bit larger than the other two, the right red, the left white, now we're going to do this is we're going to do three rounds of three breaths each. The first time we're going to inhale in through the right and then visualize it going out through the left, clearing that left channel, that white tube. We're going to do that three times. And then we're going to breathe in through the left and out through the right, clearing that right red channel. And then we'll breathe in through both the right and the left and visualize it coming up through the central channel kind of completely purifying, removing any obstacles we might have in our mind through doing this. And we'll do that three times. So again, it's helpful sometimes to cover the nostril that you're not using at the time. So you can cover your left and breathe in through your right uh, for the three breaths. And I'll guide you in that in a moment. Then when you finish uh, the three with the, the right, then you can cover the right and breathe in through the left. And then we leave our hand down and just leave both of them open for the last three. So again, cover your left and breathe in through your right now. Breathing in, bringing the air all the way down to your abdomen. Covering the right, now breathe out through the left. Cover the left, breathe in through the right. Cover the right, breathe out through the left. And then do one more on your own. In through the right, out through the left. You can keep your finger covering the right. Breathe in now through the left. 
all the way down to the abdomen, covering the left. Now breathe out through the right, clearing that right channel. Cover the right, breathe in through the left. Covering the left, breathe out through the right. One more time on your own. In through the left, out through the right. And then dropping your finger, your hand, breathe in through both. All the way down, filling the abdomen, and then breathe out, visualizing you're clearing that central blue channel. Again, in through both. And out through the central channel. One more time. So now what you're welcome to do is to do this, uh, repeat this on your own after I ring the bell here. And then when you finish it, you can do it again if you wish, uh, but certainly you can then just go to watching the breath, again, using whatever technique you use with the breath. And we'll do that for a number of minutes in silence. So I'll ring the bell here to begin the silent meditation period.
As you continue to work with the breath or whatever object, just stay vigilant. Check in occasionally to see if the mind is still with the breath. If it isn't, then just simply let go of whatever it was that distracted you and gently return to the breath.
So let's just take a few minutes to, uh, or a minute or so to dedicate any positive potential we've created through meditating today, not just for our own benefit, so that we can have calmer, cooler, uh, more focused minds, but so that we can use those minds to benefit others by developing ourselves, our heart, our wisdom, and compassion, and eventually be of greatest benefit to all beings. Okay, good. Wonderful. So uh, I guess we have uh, just a few minute breaks, five minute break or so until we start the class today. And so I'm going to go off camera for just five minutes or so, and I'll join you all very soon. It's good to see so many of you, all my good friends down there. So hello, and I'll see you shortly.
Okay, I think it's time to start then. Good. So thank you all uh, for coming today to this class. Um, Nicole put a little notice in the chat box about um, the upcoming class. I don't know if, did you need to say anything more, Nicole, before we start or no? Um, yes, I, I okay. will, Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca, okay, <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, good. So everyone, uh, we just wanna welcome Don. Don is a longtime friend of Tupton Kunga and many of you know him and have seen him and we're really lucky to have Don here with us. Uh, we had him scheduled to come in person, but coronavirus had other plans for us. So um, we appreciate you coming. Don is um, one of FPMT's uh, most important teachers. Uh, Lama Zopa Rinpoche invited him to teach the November course at Copan. He did uh, seven years at um, Lama Sankapa doing the basic program. And so if you have any questions at all, <laughs> put you on the spot, Don. Don can uh, either answer them for you or give you a, a re some really good directions. So we're just so fortunate and we appreciate you being here so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm really honored to be here. I, I, I enjoy the group. I think it was actually the year that I went to Copan. That was my first uh, visit to uh, Tupton Kunga. It was earlier that year in 2015. So um, I visited not every year, but most years since then. And it's really kind of sad not to be able to be with there with all of you, but, uh, and with the iguanas at Peggy's place. <laughs> But nonetheless, um, one thing I might just say real quickly about Tuesday night's class, because some of you may wonder, you know, whether you should come to that or not. It is studying the Heart Sutra, which, of course, is a very important text in uh, our tradition. But I'm going to make it as approachable as possible. Certainly, it is about a profound topic about the wisdom of emptiness. But I'm hoping that uh, people will feel free to join that, whatever your level of study is. Don't feel intimidated by that at all. Um, it's a, a nice way to get uh, some familiarity with that text. So I'm going to go ahead and lead just a few prayers. I think it's nice um, just to do uh, a couple of things before we begin. Um, let me, I think most people should have that on their screen now. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to do this praise to Shakyamuni Buddha one time. Sometimes we recite this three times. Uh, we're just kind of thinking about the Buddha and uh, we're studying today, kind of looking at uh, some of the Buddha's teachings around animals and working with animals as well as the advice of our uh, spiritual guides. But we can think about the Buddha's, Buddha's amazing qualities and we admire the Buddha's qualities because we want to become just like the Buddha. So this verse encapsulates all the various realizations that the Buddha has and we're sort of paying homage to the Buddha, but it's not because the Buddha needs our homage, it's because we want to align ourselves most perfectly with the Buddha and with his intentions for us, as well as our intentions uh, for ourselves and for all beings. So let's just recite this one time. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Then we'll jump down to the bottom of that first column to the taking refuge and generating bodhicitta prayer. I'll align this for next week so that it's kind of all together. But anyway, the first two lines that are at the bottom of that first column are encapsulating that idea of refuge, which most of you are familiar with. It's just whatever level of confidence and safe direction you find in the Buddha's teachings in particular, as well as the Buddha as a guide, as well as the Supreme Assembly, the Sangha, those beings who have practiced the Dharma more than us, who we can rely upon. Just really reaffirming that sense of refuge or safe direction. And at the top of the next column are the two thoughts around bodhicitta, or two lines for bodhicitta. The idea that we're here to listen to the Dharma, to engage in the Buddha's teachings so that we can accomplish Buddhahood, so that we then can join the ranks of the Buddhas and help to benefit all sentient beings. So let's just do this twice or three times in English today. Um, I've got the Tibetan up there, but I think we'll just do it in English three times. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, 
May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Now let's do just a very short meditation. Some of us were just doing meditation together, but just give us a chance to focus the mind a little bit and generate that motivation of bodhicitta even stronger. So just find a good meditation posture. We'll spend a few minutes in quiet meditation on the breath. Again, use whatever technique you generally use with the breath. If you need a suggestion, tune into that sensation in the area of the nostril where you feel the air coming in and out. There's a very subtle sensation there. Just by focusing on that, try to keep the mind undistracted. But when the mind does get distracted, when things come in that we, you know, entertaining various thoughts or, you know, worries, preoccupations, what have you, when that happens and we see that that's occurred, we just stop following that. We make the conscious choice to come back to the breath. So I'll ring the uh, chime here on this end. We'll just have a couple minutes in silence to begin with, and then I'll lead you in a short reflection. So now let's refresh our motivation for engaging in this teaching today. And ideally, again, the motivation that we are bringing to all of our teachings, to all of our activities is this mind that we just reflected on briefly in the prayer, the mind of bodhicitta. And today we're gonna to be examining in particular how we use the animals in our world, those that are in our lives quite directly, as well as animals in general, as a support, a support for generating deeper compassion, deeper connection to others. So already think about the animals that are in your life. Many of you no doubt have pets or you have beings that you know, are 
nearby in your property or friends, animals, pets. And just think about those beings and the way that you already contribute to their welfare. Certainly, if you do have animals that you care for by feeding them and so on, just be really glad that you have a heart that does that, that extends out to others with concern for their well-being. But also think about all the other ways that you engage in care and concern for animals in your life as well as for the people in your life. All of this is the seed of bodhicitta. Every time that we extend ourselves out with a wish to relieve the suffering of others, to help them to have some measure of happiness in their lives, this is what feeds and from which all of this, you know, uh, from all of this bodhicitta arises. Every time that we express our love, our compassion, becomes a cause that helps us to move in that direction. So in our own minds right now, think about having that universal love and compassion, a concern and a regard for all beings, and a sincere wish that we eventually attain a state where we can benefit them most completely, most perfectly. And that is the state of Buddhahood, the perfection of our own minds so that we then have all of what we need, you know, complete compassion, wisdom, power, all the skillful means to be able to benefit all beings. And think that we're here today to examine this topic of practicing compassion for animals as a way to help us on that path so that we can eventually attain the state of Buddhahood and lead all beings to that same state. Okay, great. Again, thanks for joining. So this is a talk that um, I put together some years ago because I wanted to do something actually uh, on October 4th, I think, is World Animal Day. It's actually the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, who is, of course, renowned for a lot of his um, closeness to animals, uh, his affection for animals. And so, again, it's just a talk that I've been doing here and there, but that I like to enlarge upon each time I do it. And this was the first time I actually did some PowerPoint slides for it. So you'll get a chance to see those with some of the main points that we're going to discuss. Let me go ahead and pull that up now and we can get started with going into the main material here. Let me uh, put it in as an actual slideshow. Uh, I found this wonderful little collage of some photos of Lama Zopa Rinpoche with various animals. Of course, Rinpoche uh, has a very uh, kind heart towards animals. And there are even some videos. We won't have time to watch any of those today. But if you go to YouTube and you put in Lama Zopa Rinpoche and dogs or whatever other animal, you'll see generally some video of Rinpoche with fish blessing the water that the fish go into. Or uh, he'll see a dog in a car with the window cracked open and he'll go and recite some mantras to the dog. And so Rinpoche is always doing something to benefit animals whenever he sees an animal that has been just there or injured, hurt, what have you or even an animal that has died doing prayers uh, for that animal. So I'm going to hopefully impart some of Rinpoche's concern for animals. I'll be sharing some of his advice as well. But um, one thing, uh, before we get too far in it, just know that there is a handout that uh, I passed on to Rebecca that she'll make available to everyone. I may be sharing little bits of that on screen as well, but it gives you more of Rinpoche's advice and some links for a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about. So today I want to break this talk into four main parts. Uh, each of these will have a bit more to them, some of them longer than others, but the very beginning we'll just briefly go into the Buddhist worldview, kind of the context for everything that we're looking at in terms of animals, and then looking at the need for compassion for animals, um, kind of where is this in terms of our practice. And then the specific ways, this is what we'll spend a bit more time on perhaps, is the ways to care for the animals, especially those that are in our lives right now, that are our pets and so on. And then other issues related to animals, where we'll talk about uh, vegetarianism, veganism, these sorts of ideas uh, that I think are important to discuss in the context of compassion for animals. And that'll also be a bit longer section. So the first few sections are maybe not so long, but uh, the main part of today is really to give you uh, ways to generate deeper compassion and concern for animals in your own life. 
So um, in terms of the Buddhist worldview, uh, the very first point I want to make is around the nature of mind and karma. And many of you, again, are already firmly rooted in the Buddha's teachings, but this is something always that's important to go back to, is to really understand the centrality of mind and, of course, how mind functions to create the world that we experience, the various existences that we have. We'll go then into talking a little bit about samsara and the realms of existence, and then the animal realm in particular and its experiences. Uh, that uh, is a, kind of the main topic for today. So um, I shared on the screen here two verses. First, verse one of the Dhammapada. This is how the, the sayings of the Buddha that are not used maybe as much in the Tibetan tradition, though there is a Tibetan version of these uh, verses of the Buddha. Um, the, this is uh, one from the Pali Canon, though, that's translated by Gil Fransdal. And there's two verses. The very first one talks about mind and karma in terms of how suffering arises. And the Buddha says, all experience is preceded by mind, led by mind, made by mind. Speak or act with a corrupted mind, and suffering follows, as the wagon wheel follows the hoof of the ox. Then you'll see the first part of the next verse is exactly the same. All experience is preceded by mind, led by mind, made by mind. Speak or act with a peaceful mind and happiness follows, like a never-departing shadow. Of course, what these verses are speaking to, again, is the centrality of mind involved in all of our experiences, and it's, of course, the mechanism of karma that causes all that to happen. And helping out with the karma module that Venerable Tendron started um, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, on Thursday nights, I'm helping with that, because it is such an important topic of the Buddhas. And it's something that, again, we can't have uh, a way of proving it. I can't prove karma to you. But there is this idea that sort of the mental energy that we create, whatever it is that goes on in what we call mind, which is interdependent with our brains and our central nervous system in these human bodies that we have, but is still got its own sort of continuity. It is awareness. It's consciousness. It's this flow, this stream of continued moment after moment after moment. And even when we are in sleep or, you know, not as conscious, it's still kind of there as an undercurrent going through all of our life. And every moment of mine, because it has some level of intention, meaning it's drawing or drawn towards a particular object, there's always some karma created. Karma in its essence means action, and it is in this sense the mental action, the movement of our minds, which of course is not just the force of movement that we go to looking at a desirable object, for example, a beautiful, uh, you know, portrait or a, a, a delicious piece of cake or whatever the case might be. Uh, but it's also then everything that accompanies that mind. And as we saw in those verses, if we have a corrupted mind, if we bring to that experience of the piece of cake or the beautiful portrait or whatever, and we have this mind of craving and desire and attachment, then we're going to have suffering patterns follow from that. If we have a mind of anger, uh, delu uh, delusions that are like that, jealousy that are very upsetting to the mind, then we will obviously create patterns that will cause suffering in our future experience. This is kind of this sort of mental energy that we're always creating. It's always hard to put kind of a label on what karma is, but essentially it's, it's energy. It's mental energy, movement of the mind in particular directions. And if we have the corrupted state of mind, According to the very basic laws of karma, we are going to create suffering experiences. Whereas, as it was said in the second verse, if we have a peaceful state of mind, a mind that is together with compassionate thoughts like we're discussing today, then we get the causes of happiness, of well-being. Because those thoughts are in that nature. They're, they're much more uh, open-hearted. They're much more uh, fulfilling. Whereas everything else that's a negative mind is all about closing down. So we can see that, again, this is the mechanism by which we have experiences. Our mind has been existing since beginningless time. There's no beginning point to the mind because it always was preceded by another moment of mind. Our mind will go forward without any end. Of course, where it goes to is greatly dependent upon the mental movement that we create, the actions that we create. So this is how the Buddha described this whole process that's part of what we call samsara. 
samsara being the cycle of existence, the wheel of life, that we are being propelled from existence to existence through the force of karma, through the force of our own thoughts and actions. So that gets us into the second topic within this uh, sort of Buddhist worldview, which is the idea of samsara and the realms of existence. So on the left-hand side of the screen is the wheel of life, which uh, yeah, many of you are familiar with. Uh, I try to discuss it in Discovering Buddhism when we get to uh, samsara and nirvana module nine but nonetheless it is a pretty intricate teaching but it kind of within this diagram are all the various realms of existence that are arising from our own states of mind as well as the actions the karma that we create so on the right hand side is the center wheel where we do have on the outside of the wheel what are called these 12 links of dependent arising which again are beyond the scope of what we're talking about today but those kind of six sectors that are in the just inside the ring of the wheel those are the six realms of existence uh, the three that are on the top are the realms of the demigods starting with the ones that are at about uh, 10 o'clock then up at noon are the gods and then at about two o'clock are the humans uh, our own human existence is one of the most positive states uh, there's less suffering in these god realms but nonetheless the human realm is said to be quite ideal but we share the human realm with the animals and so the animals are often you know put in a realm where they're nearby the humans in this diagram i don't think that they are i think it's actually the hungry ghosts that are below the humans at around four o'clock and then at six o'clock is the hell realms and then at uh, about eight o'clock would be the animal realm but these are the various existences that we are driven into through the force of our actions, which if you go then to the, the wheel that's inside those six spokes um, that are kind of the different realms, you'll see that there are a kind of karma that goes down, karma that goes up. Uh, actions that take us into the upper realms, actions that take us down into the lower realms. And then what's in the very center, the hub of the wheel, is actually a uh, symbolic of the three poisons, the three states of mind that are behind all of this our ignorance, which is uh, signified by a pig, and then our anger, which is signified by a snake, and then our desire, our attachment, which is signified by a rooster. But anyway, the idea behind the Buddhist worldview is that we have at the center of our experience all these states of mind, as was said in those verses from the Dhammapada, the corrupted states, as well as we can even have some potentially positive states, that will still be together with some level of ignorance, but they won't be attachment and anger and those sorts of things. They'll be love, compassion, kindness, the things we're talking about today. But they will really just result in good karma that takes us up to those higher realms, to the realms of the gods and the humans and so on. Every one of you, because you have a human existence, created very positive potential in a prior life through your good actions, that mental energy that you created, that now ripened into this human existence. If you create through the force of greater delusion and some of those negative states of mind, the negative karma, that will drive you into one of these lower realms. And of course, the lower realm that we're talking about today is the realm of the animals. I want to share with you a couple of quotes from a book that's about uh, compassion for animals by Norm Phelps, who is a Buddhist practitioner, as far as I can tell, though he does have a strong background in a lot of other theology and spirituality. And he says, you know, it kind of gives the framework for this, which I think is an important part of our working with animals today and understanding it. He says the hierarchy of samsara, because we often talk about the three lower realms, the three upper realms, just like I did, is a hierarchy of suffering, not a hierarchy of beings, all inhabitants of samsara, which is to say all sentient beings are not simply equal, but are indistinguishable in their essential nature. And this is kind of the, the core teaching that is at the root of our compassion for all beings is because we are essentially all the same when it comes down to our Buddha nature and so on. So he goes on to say, the realms we inhabit are only temporary abodes. And as we travel on in search of enlightenment, we will move about from one to another as easily as moving from one floor to another in our imaginary apartment building. And then he goes on to describe that. He says, in the analogy of the apartment, the resident is the Buddha nature, you know, kind of this pure mind that we have that is polluted at this moment, but it has kind of this natural purity. It kind of is our, the resident within this apartment building. The apartment is the body and mind 
which that Buddha nature temporarily occupies. So right now you have a human apartment. You know, maybe in a prior life you had an animal apartment or whatever other apartment. Uh, and the floor, that particular floor that you're on, is the realm. Whether you're on the first floor, second floor, third floor, fifth floor, all the way up to the sixth floor, these various realms of existence, the three that are upper, the three that are lower, you know, it simply is the realm that you've been, you know, uh, living in. That's the abode that you're in, the apartment that you're occupying. Life in samsara, he goes on to say, is an interminable series of short-term rentals and disruptive moves from one substandard apartment to another that ends only when we gain enlightenment and vacate the building. Of course, now we don't completely vacate the building because the goal in Buddhism is, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism in particular, is to help all the other beings that are still in the apartment building. But I'd never, you know, run across that type of an analogy, but it really kind of works because it once more understands that we're all residents within this hierarchy of various uh, levels of suffering. But there's, it's not the beings themselves that are cast into that sort of in any permanent way. You know, we have the good fortune, every one of us, of having this human existence right now. But this human existence is just one level in this apartment building. And when we check out of this apartment and have our next move to our next substandard apartment, who knows where we will be? We could be back into an animal realm where we have been, the Buddha says, countless times. So when we are looking at other beings like animals, we're trying to have that understanding that they are just like us. They have a mind, a consciousness, an awareness that is just simply at another floor of this apartment building that we call samsara, having a different experience than we are, but equal in their regard, you know, in, in terms of being equal beings. There's no differentiation at that level. Of course, another great thing that, that shows that there's no differentiation is the fundamental drive that all beings have as their sort of basic root desire which we can certainly see in animals. It maybe isn't manifested as much as we see in humans, but we can certainly detect it, which is this desire to be happy and to be free from suffering. This is what's driving every single being to do all of what they do. Even when they commit negative actions, these are often done out of a wish to not suffer, right? You know, wish to be happy. So we see that that's the fundamental drive we just have to have this understanding and this awareness that everyone is sort of going about it in their own way. And we have to be willing to um, acknowledge that where beings are at is due to this whole process of karma. But they're not fixed in that abode. You know, animals are not animals forever. They leave that animal state and they go on to their next apartment. And then they leave that and they go on to their next apartment and so on. Of course, the goal, as was said by Norm Phelps so eloquently, is to get out of the apartment building ourselves, but then, of course, to get everyone else out of the apartment building, you know, to keep acting in the world for their benefit. So how do we train our minds to do that? By working with animals now. So let's look a little bit more than the third topic within this first part of kind of the Buddhist worldview is to understand then the animal realm. This is a little panel, a close-up of one of those uh, shots of the animal realm in the six spokes that come out from the central, central wheel on the wheel of life. So you'll see that the, there's a Buddha present in that. You know, the, every one of those realms actually on the wheel of life has a Buddha in it. Why? Because Buddhas stay in all the various apartments, you know, on the various levels. They're, they're there to help beings, you know, at whatever level they're at. And of course, here we are sharing this abode with animals. So we do have an opportunity to be connected to them, as many of us do in terms of our pets. But also, you know, we are interconnected in this world with many, many animal species. There's something like 7.7 .7 million, 7.7 .7 billion animal species, I think is the number that was in one of the books that I was reading. I mean, there are so many animals in this world. We, we can't even really have a good understanding of the variety of animals that live on the earth, in the air, in the sea, under the ground. I mean, there's just a, a huge number of beings. So animals, of course, in the traditional Buddhist teachings are talked about in terms of their having a very limited experience. Why? Because the fundamental delusion that drives one to take rebirth in an animal realm and the actions that follow from that are when we're, we're kind of dealing with ignorance, with a sort of dullness of the mind, the mind not being so sharp. And of course, we see this in the animal realm, right? And not that we're, again, we're not about putting those beings down because we've been animals. This is the type of karma that causes one to take an animal rebirth, is to then be somewhat obscured with the nature of things, with how to work with their minds. So um, the, the one 
kind of uh, way that we need to look at this then is to understand that beings who are in the animal realm, while they do lack some of the acuity and the intelligence that we have in the human realm, they still have that conscious awareness that can be influenced, that can be you know, interacted with. I mean, this is why we find our pets so delightful, right? Is because they can show us love and compassion and care and concern. We're not denying that for many species. That's very much a part of the case. In fact, um, Mark uh, Beckoff, I think is his name. Uh, he's an animal activist. It's written a number of books. And I saw him on one nature show that was on uh, PBS where he was talking about how the fundamental roots of empathy and compassion in the animal world are what happens in the mother-infant bond, you know, which of course happens in the human realm as well. We're very similar. We are animals in that regard and have evolved from animals, are still in that continuity of animals in this world. But we see that there's many of these uh, opportunities within the animal realm for that type of an expression, for that type of closeness, in spite of the fact that animals are obscured greatly with regard to reality and how to work with their minds. You know, I always joke that if I had uh, my pets in here with me, you know, while I'm teaching, uh, they'd be just sleeping, right? You know, they would be like, if I'm not going to play with them, they're just going to go to sleep, right? And that's, you know, I can't really teach them the Dharma. I can't really impart to them how to meditate and all these various things that we try to do in this tradition. But it doesn't mean I can't benefit them. Because they are in our world, because we can see the interconnection that we have with so many of them, it's important that we then take advantage of that relationship. So animals, of course, you know, our, our limited experience with animals in this world, of course, as we've developed society, we've gotten further and further away from being interactive with animals uh, in a more natural setting rather than the insects and things and the iguanas in Florida and what have you that have encroached upon, you know, living abodes and what have you. But, you know, we still do interact with animals in a, in a domesticated sense with our pets and what have you. But that still is, you know, not the full view of the animal existence. If we understand what it's really like to be animals out in the wild, it's a very, very fearful state, they say. Of course, that ignorance that is driving the show for them makes them incapable of doing a lot to uh, address that fear. And so many of them live their lives completely in danger, completely threatened by the world around them. And of course, humanity has become a part of that threat uh, by you know, burning down uh, forested areas and what have you and encroaching upon their environments. So again, this is the, the ex existence, the experience of animals in our world that we can see. And it's one that should, again, really break our hearts because we see that we ourselves, as well as any being, can be propelled in that, to that type of existence, can have that type of karma within the realms of samsara, the various apartment levels. And then, of course, we go on from there. But while they're here with us, while we're sort of, you know, sharing two levels of the apartment <laughs> building that we can traverse between, we can kind of see what it's like to be in the animal realm by interacting with animals. And they, of course, can interact with us. Why not take advantage of that? And by the way, all the other realms that the Buddha taught, you know, it, it might take some deeper level of faith to believe in those, but the animal realm is a wonderful way that we can actually connect with others and see their suffering quite directly. Lama Zopa Rinpoche used to recommend that students of his watch some of these animal shows that are on PBS that are pretty, you know, showing nature and uh, red in tooth and claw. I think it was the phrase from one of the poets that, you know, it shows that this is what animal life is like, you know, being preyed upon and then becoming the prey for another predator and so on. You know, the life of animals in general is not that pleasant. So this is kind of, again, showing the Buddhist worldview of how animals fit into this. Let's go on to the next topic, which is really driving the rest of what we're going to talk about today, the need for compassion for animals. And it begins with looking at the status of animals in our world, which I've just touched on a little bit. But we can certainly see that from the very beginning, you know, the human beings were animals as well, trying to eke out a way to survive in this world, uh, to raise their status. And in the process of that, they kind of co-op uh, 
cohabitated the planet, if you will, with animals. But over time, our relationship to animals has certainly changed. Um, there's a quote that comes from um, Elizabeth Fisher that's actually in a book by Matthew Ricard that I've been reading called A Plea for the Animals. Uh, many of you may have heard of Venerable Matthew. He's a monk in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and he's written a number of books. And I, I really like this book. I haven't finished it all. But he has a quote from this woman, Elizabeth Fisher, who seems to be an anthropologist of some sort, uh, mostly working around women's roles in history and what have you. But he, she says, by keeping them and feeding them, humans at first entered into bonds of friendship with animals. Then they killed them. To reach that point, they had to kill a part of their own sensibility. The enslavement of animals seems to have served as the model for the enslavement of human beings. Of course, this is something that, you know, is still playing a role in terms of our society, the way that we have dealt with animals then has influenced the way that we dealt with many people, uh, including, you know, African Americans and uh, Native Americans and uh, other people who, you know, are, you know, the object that were looked upon as less than human. And when people start doing that with animals, it gives sort of permission to do that with other human beings. So we see that animals fell into that category. Of course, and we can look at it and understand that, again, they don't have the ability even to defend themselves often in terms of uh, humans encroaching upon them, doing things to them, eventually killing them, uh, using them for their meat, and so on. So they just became servile. Uh, doing this to other humans kind of came right out of all of that. So we see that kind of these patterns are very much still active in our world. And if we are ever to really address and sort of redress a lot of what has occurred, we have to begin to look at how we are looking at animals. What is their status in this world? I mean, I find it still a bit, uh, certainly we've gone, we've come a long way in terms of society. You can you know, have things like vegetarianism and veganism accepted in many parts of the world. I was actually quite surprised when I started doing my international travel, uh, even in parts of the US, of course, there are many places you can go to where there's not so many vegetarian options and what have you. But I was really concerned when I was going to places like Russia and that that I have visited a couple of times and I was so concerned that I wasn't gonna be able to maintain a vegetarian diet. And I was actually pleasantly surprised to find that they had some of the best vegetarian and food I've ever had. So there are many kind of sort of a shift in terms of accepting some of these things that have moved away from the status of animals that has developed within our human world of looking down upon them, using them, uh, abusing them to a large degree, as well as, of course, taking their lives. But nonetheless, we still have a lot of work to do. And, and when I do talk to people about Buddhist ideas, even in some of our interfaith gatherings where many Christians and other people might have a strong compassion and concern for human beings, it's maybe not as large for animals. And when I'll talk about mosquitoes and insects and things like that, which we'll touch on today, many people even who are Buddhists have a hard time kind of seeing those as sentient beings that they need to respect and have some compassion for. But all of these beings are simply one more, and once more an apartment level in the realms of samsara. Our own minds have occupied rooms in that apartment level before. We have been a mosquito. We have been uh, an ant. We have been a worm. We've been every single type of creature that exists. And we had the same motivation when we were those creatures. And you can see it, right? If you, you know, go to try to threaten an ant or some other small being, it moves away from it right away. It values its life. It doesn't want to be harmed. So we do see that, again, we have to find touchstones, ways to increase the status of animals in this world so that we recognize them as equal beings. Not that, again, they're equal in all ways. We're not, we're not trying to say that. But in terms of them being sentient beings, beings who are uh, consciousness embodied in a form that are here with that simple goal of wanting to be happy, wanting to not suffer, how do we learn to abide well with them? So the history of animals, again, uh, uh, Matthew Ricard in his introduction goes into a lot of that. And I think it's a beautiful read because it, and it does very, it's very uh, revealing in terms of what has all transpired over time. Um, there's no you know, absolute uh, history of all this because we tend to write the history of humans rather than the history of animals. But animals obviously are not at the same status level as humans for most of us. 
of course, the role of compassion in Buddhist practice plays uh, a part of our, desire, our understanding the need for compassion for animals. Um, I have this uh, quote that I use often from Christina Feldman. Um, she's referring to a sutra of the Buddha where it says the Buddha was once asked by a disciple, would it be true to say that part of our practice is to develop loving kindness and compassion? No, the Buddha answered. It would be true to say that the whole of our practice is to develop loving kindness and compassion. You know, all traditions of Buddhism have compassion at the root of their core practice. In terms of even karma, morality, it is dictated largely by the concept that is called ahimsa. Ahimsa is non-harmfulness, which is the essence of compassion, that you know, we are not going to harm other beings through our actions. And when you look at the teachings on karma, almost everything the Buddha laid out, other than the mental karmas, which are solely done within our own minds, um, whereas the physical and verbal actions, they're all actions that involve harming other beings in some way diminishing the quality of their lives. So we see that non-harmfulness is the root of compassion, is a real essence of our practice at whatever Buddhist tradition you know, we're talking about. Of course, non-harmfulness is also there in many other traditions. And don't get me wrong when I was talking about earlier about some of my Christian friends and talking to them. Many of them are very compassionate towards animals. It's just they don't see the broader sweep of animals that all need to be embraced with compassion. And of course, in Buddhist terms, we're trying to develop compassion for all beings. And that's because our compassion for beings is playing a role in helping us to move towards the ideal goal of Buddhahood, of being able to benefit all of those beings. So we know that compassion is really quite essential, and that's why we're talking about it today in regard to animals, is because we can actually say that animals give us amazing opportunities to practice compassion. And we also see, of course, the benefits of that. And this uh, is sort of the third topic within this need for compassion for animals, is to see that there's great benefit to our practice of compassion towards animals, as well as from the receiving end of those animals, uh, receiving the compassionate thoughts and actions. So this is a quote from, of course, Jane Goodall, who you, uh, I don't know that there's a person on the planet who doesn't know who Jane Goodall is. Um, she's also written extensively about animal rights and so on. She says, if only we can overcome cruelty to human and animal, of course, because this is still going on in the human world, uh, man's inhumanity to man, with, you know, if we can overcome that cruelty with love and compassion, we shall stand at the threshold of a new era in human moral and spiritual evolution and realize at last our most unique quality, humanity. So this is the, the, the huge benefit for each of us individually is that if we keep moving in the direction of having greater and greater compassion for animals in this world, we bring more and more integrity to the human race and to our presence on this planet. You know, if we look at, again, the, historically what's happened, and there were certainly some spiritual traditions that fed more into this idea of us being in dominion over animals and animals being here simply to serve us. And of course, there is something that from my own understanding of being Catholic, being raised Catholic, was that, you know, animals didn't have souls in Christian thinking. And so that in that way, they are, they're, they're not uh, the same as humans. The humans have a greater status from that point of view. And so there's an ability then to abuse animals and use animals without any regard for their suffering. Nonetheless, there are many great Christian thinkers as well as other thinkers from other tradition, traditions who have said that we need to have compassion for these beings, that there's actually great faults if we don't, and there's great benefit if we do because this becomes an extension of our hearts. It helps us to stay open to compassion to all. And it is true that people who tend to be crueler towards animals often then have no problem becoming cruel towards other human beings. You know, it's kind of a slippery slope. And so we see the benefits are immense. If we are able to practice this, of course, how wonderful the beings on this planet become recipients of our kindness, our compassion, our concern. We don't just start wiping them out left and right by removing their forest habitats and what have you. But I think it is a whole elevation to the moral quality of this entire planet if we are able to go to a place of greater compassion for all sentient beings in this world. We're going to get into this in two weeks when we talk even about ecology and kind of a, the human heart and how we need to constantly embrace this bigger picture of what we are about here. And we get so caught up in our little microcosm. Of course, this, this pandemic has forced us to some degree to almost be 
in an even smaller little microcosm, you know, because many of us aren't even interacting with others other than these wonderful opportunities on Zoom and what have you. But our world has become very, very small, but we don't, we can't lose the perspective that we are still quite interconnected with the entire world, especially with the animal world. You know, and it's been interesting to watch how uh, such great misfortune has also come upon animals as we've dealt with this pandemic. I mean, it just broke my heart to hear about how all these pigs and cows were slaughtered because they couldn't get them to the, you know, the slaughterhouses where they would be made into meat to be sold in the stores and what have you. I mean, they would be losing their lives anyway, but it was just heartbreaking to see that there wasn't even any usefulness from that perspective and such cruelty. And anyway, we'll get into shortly about vegetarianism in the meat industry, but it obviously is a huge thing uh, that we need to be aware of and to address because there'd be great benefit, obviously, to the animal world if humans were to move away from any of that type of cruelty. The final thing I want to touch on and go through this rather quickly because most of you have some uh, orientation towards this is that this compassion that we're talking about and the benefits of compassion ripen eventually into bodhicitta. Uh, Charles Darwin himself said, humanity toward inferior animals is one of the noblest of virtues with which man is endowed, and it is part of the final stage of the development of moral sentiments. It is only when we become concerned for the totality of sentient beings that our morality attains its highest level. I'd never heard this quote from Charles Darwin. Again, it was in Matthew Ricard's introductory, his whole first chapter around the history of humans and animals and so on. But this is really what bodhicitta is, in essence, is the kind of recognition that this is the culmination of our morality in this world, our being dedicated to the benefit of all sentient beings, especially, again, to include animals. But we have to also include humans, because eh? most of us, again, have our blocks there as well. Then from this uh, very interesting book called Food for Bodhisattvas, uh, Food of Bodhisattvas, actually I think is the title, I made a mistake on that slide, it's supposed to be Food of Bodhisattvas, um, by this great Nyingma practitioner, Tibetan Buddhism called Shapkar. He says, in all the births that we have taken in the unending circles of samsara, there is no being that has not once been our mother. Of course, many of you are familiar with this is one of the main meditations that helps us to feel a closeness, a kinship to these sentient beings, these animals or human beings or whoever. And when these beings nurtured us, he says, they were as kind to us as our own mothers have been in this present life. This recognition that we have been connected to every single being, that they are each our mother sentient being, is a way that we can enhance this feeling of compassion and bring it to that place of bodhicitta where we want to be a benefit to those beings. Of course, most of you are familiar with the steps in developing this, but Shabkar goes on to say, this is why we must adopt the practice of the seven-point instruction in causal sequence to train our minds in bodhicitta. First, as was just said, we must recognize that all beings have been our mothers. Second, we must be mindful of the kindness they have shown us. So when there's that ant on your counter, you can think, this was my mother, and as my mother, showed me unbelievable kindness. Third, resolve to repay them, to think at this moment, I've got this human existence, and I want to repay that kind, sentient being for all the kindness that they showed me. Fourth, we must feel a tender love for them kind of generated thoughts of loving kindness towards them, wanting them to be happy. And fifth, great compassion, which is what we're talking about today. You know, that compassionate uh, desire to help them uh, be free from suffering. Sixth, we must then cultivate the extraordinary thought of universal responsibility, this altruistic motivation to be dedicated to the welfare of these beings. And seventh, come thereby to the unsurpassable result, the attitude of bodhicitta. So this is kind of, again, many of you are familiar with this sevenfold cause and effect technique as it's called, but this is about feeling this closeness towards others and this compassionate wish to benefit them that culminates in this mind of bodhicitta, which is the desire to become a Buddha for the sake of those beings. So anyway, I'm just putting that all into this uh, second topic, the need for compassion for animals, because it's central to our practice in the Mahayana tradition. Every one of us is here because we've got some in inclination towards these Mahayana teachings, especially in the Tibetan Buddhist lineage, you know, with such great examples as His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Lama Zopa Rinpoche there to kind of show us what it's like to live this compassionate life. Well, 
animals are here in our world and we need to recognize that they're amazing window of opportunity for us to enhance our compassion and by virtue of that enhance our bodhicitta they say you cannot develop complete bodhicitta until you have included every single sentient being within the scope of that mind so begin now begin with the beings that you have begin with those beings that you know are in your life and that can be uh, objects of your compassion so let's go on then. We'll, we'll have time for some questions at the end, I'm hoping. Um, let me go into the main part of what we want to talk about. And by the way, this part, there is much more information in the handout that I've uh, given to Rebecca that you all get. Um, we want to talk about ways to care for animals. The first is that we want to talk about caring for pets during their lives because pets are the main ones here. We're going to you know, kind of focus on them because most of us do have pets. But you could certainly, I mean, translate some of this to other beings that might occasionally occupy your house, you know, insects or what have you that get in. But uh, caring for pets at the time of death and afterwards, because these are beings that are in our own household, it is important that we be more attentive to their needs and to what uh, will be spiritually valuable for them at the time of death and even after death. And then we're going to talk a bit about caring for other animals, the general animals that, again, we have in our environment around us, sometimes in our own homes, the insects, birds, and so on. So, in terms of caring for pets during their lives, once more, we want to do all of these activities that are on the screen with the motivation of bodhicitta, with this wish to benefit them most deeply. But we can say the main practice that we have in caring for pets is the practice of generosity, of giving, what Rinpoche likes to call charity. But well, we have different forms of charity that are traditionally taught in Buddhism, and every one of these applies to how we relate to animals, especially our pets. The first one is the giving of material things. Of course, if we've got pets, every one of them needs to eat every day, right? They need to have sustenance. They need water, especially you know, with hot weather and so on that we're having. They need to be cared for with very, you know, all this physical stuff. Without that, they will lose their lives. So if we can give them material things, give them that, with a mind of bodhicitta, with a mind of ultimately wanting to benefit them, but also if we can find a way to bless their food. This is so important. And you know, another thing that comes into play in here as we're talking about giving food to animals as being part of caring for them, it's an act of generosity. Well, we're often giving animals food that comes from animals, right? You know, because most of the animals we have as pets are carnivores. You know, they do rely upon uh, the meat from uh, other animals. I've read up a little bit. I haven't read extensively, but it does seem that there are some companies that are producing vegetarian diets for pets that are balanced enough to be able to allow the pets to live a complete full life uh, without having to eat the meat of other beings. But I think it's fairly rare for that to be um, something that can be widely adapted. Um, maybe over time it will become much more available, but... Um, these are carnivorous beings that we've invited to our homes, especially cats. Cats are true carnivores, and we can even see it in terms of their outside behavior, going after birds and mice and what have you, you know, that they, they, they are natural hunters, and they will go after that and try to sustain themselves in that way, uh, given the chance. Okay, so then you're sitting there and you, you, you know, take out the, the cat food or the dog food or whatever it is that you're going to feed your pet. Think about the beings that went into making that. And even if it's dry food, there are beings that went into making that. Think about them and think about blessing them by reciting mantra on that food. And Rinpoche goes into this, the mantras that you should recite. If you can even just remember the simple mantra, Om Mani Peme Hong. Om Mani Peme Hong is this uh, mantra of the Buddha of compassion, which is a very, very powerful mantra because it helps to in, awaken the compassion in ourselves, but it also helps to make that compassionate connection to others, to want to become like the compassion Buddha and be dedicated to the welfare of all beings. So all we do is we simply recite Om Mani Peme Hong several times and blow onto the food before we feed it to our pets and give it to our pets with a mind of bodhicitta that wants to benefit them, to help them so that we can eventually give even greater things to them. We can benefit them to a larger degree. If you have other mantras that you want to recite, that's fine. You can also blow on water and then put the water uh, into their um, dishes for them to drink or sprinkle the water on their food or whatever the case might be. The, you know, these are very powerful ways to use mantra. By the way, those of you who are not familiar with mantra, mantra essentially means mind protection. 
And the individual mantras that are used in this tradition are ways to protect our own minds through using the vocalizations of Buddhas. It said that every one of these mantras was sort of the utterance of a Buddha that it encapsulates the essence of that Buddha. So it's said to be very, very powerful. You know, again, as a way to awaken these qualities in ourselves, as well as to help uh, the beings that we are blessing through the force of that. You don't have to be any greatly realized being to use these mantras. It's nice if you can get initiations, empowerment, so that reciting it becomes even more powerful. But that's not necessary even. Just to recite them is perfectly fine. And just to say again, oh, mani pay me hung several times over the food and then blow on it. It blesses the food so that when the being receives it, as well as the beings that went into making it, they are all sort of blessed by virtue of that. Now, how does that all work karmically? That gets you know beyond my own understanding. But uh, Rinpoche very much emphasizes this as a way of compassionately connecting to others and helping them. So that's one of the things, again, that we talk about the physical ways that we benefit through giving material things to our pets. The other one is giving protection. Of course, this is a big thing for pets, right? Because if we don't protect our pets, if we don't make sure that they are sheltered, that they are, you know, not in danger of certainly if they're living in cities, environments where there's cars and other things around that would take their lives, as well as predatory beings that might take their lives. Here in New Mexico, we have coyotes that sweep through neighborhoods. And if your, you know, pet is out, it can often become prey for them. Um, this is an important thing that we do in terms of the weather, too, when it's very hot outside to protect our animals from having to have heat exhaustion and so on by being outdoors. This is a, a huge thing that we do for our pets is to protect them from danger. We also, of course, protect them from illness by uh, making sure that they get medical care, medical treatment, and so on when necessary. So there's lots of ways that we are involved in that second type of generosity with our pets. And once more, do that with bodhicitta motivation. Do that thinking about all beings benefiting from our taking care of our pets. The third type of generosity is generosity of Dharma. And this is where Rinpoche, of course, emphasizes because he's not, it's not that he isn't concerned about you sort of physically taking care of your uh, pets. He wants to make sure you take care of their minds. And of course, this is the main thing that we can offer to others. This is where he includes blessing food, but I put it up with uh, food and giving material things because it was more relevant there. But he says one of the things that we can do to um, you know, help our animals is to allow them to circumambulate holy objects. So maybe you have some holy objects on your altar, like I've got my altar behind me, uh, some uh, objects that were blessed by various uh, Rinpoche's uh, teachers, what have you. You can put them on a table in the center of a room and you can walk your dog around the the holy objects we're going to talk about this in terms of the animal liberation practice later i'm going to introduce that briefly but this is a very powerful way to put imprints on their mind there's actually a story about a fly that landed on a pile of cow dung that was floating on water that was around a stupa and while the fly was eating the cow dung the it went all the way around the stupa so it made a circumambulation and according to the Buddha's or some holy beings omniscience, their ability to sort of see that, they saw that that karma of that having happened was planted incredible virtue in their minds. That's because holy objects do have some power. We're not saying they have power completely from their own side in terms of nothing exists from its own side, but conventionally it does have power. It is something that is imbued with blessings because of the relics that are put there, all of the various blessings of the holy beings on these objects. They make them into something that is of greater power for us, just like a magnet has greater power than a piece of iron that is not magnetized. You know, in conventional terms, there's a difference between those two. Uh, the magnetized uh, iron has a different uh, quality, a higher quality, if you will. And so it's the same with these holy objects. If you have some faith and conviction in holy objects, take your animals around holy objects. If there's a stupa nearby, I don't know if there is or not. I've never visited a stupa in the Deerfield Beach area, but if you can go out to a place where you can walk your dog or your animal around that, that stupa, how, how wonderful. Uh, we have some here in Santa Fe, and it's really good uh, to do things in relation to those holy objects. Of course, reciting prayers, sutras in their presence is also really good. Although your, your animal might be asleep, you know, your dog's just kind of crashed on the floor there. And if you want to recite sutra as part of your own practice, recite the heart sutra, what I'm going to be teaching on on Tuesday night, recite other sutras. Do it in their presence. Why not? 
you know, it plants imprints. One of the things about consciousness, so I started off talking about mind or consciousness, know that everything that we do and everything that we hear, everything that comes in through any of our senses is imprinted on the consciousness to some degree. You know, it may not have huge deep effects at the moment, but it's there. It's, it's never wasted. Everything kind of comes in and implants some sort of imprint, albeit very subtle. Well, this is one of the ways we can benefit beings who are in the homes with us is by sitting them down and, you know, reciting things to them, recite our prayers to them. If you do a regular practice, how wonderful to share that with them by vocalizing that in their presence. Now, I have one cat here that likes to sit down with me when I meditate on my cushion. She's not very good at staying there for very long, but how wonderful. She gets to stay there for the time she does, and then you know she can wander off or whatever. But this is an important thing that Rinpoche emphasizes. He also emphasizes giving your pets Dharma names. You know, we have lots of things like um, Sangye. Sangye means Buddha. Um, or uh, I think he talks in here about he gave uh, one dog the name Omani Pemehung. Of course, it got shortened eventually to probably like Mani or what have you. But nonetheless, you know, give them a name that once more, every time they hear that, it gives a very powerful imprint on their minds. And we might not have great faith or conviction in this, but why not? <laughs> Rinpoche gives us this advice, so it's very precious to use Dharma names uh, for our animals if we can. Um, so those are the main ways that he talks about it. But again, anything that we can do to take the Dharma, which they're not able to understand. Again, I can't sit my cats or a dog down or something and teach them how to meditate, teach them the Four Noble Truths, teach them the Heart Sutra. It's not going to work in terms of them getting it. But if I at least say these things in their presence, it plants the seeds for them to be able to realize this in the future. Some kind being no doubt did that for you in the past. You know, you, you're, you're partaking of the Dharma now because some being imparted the Dharma to you in a way that you may not have understood a single word of it, but it created an imprint that ripened into your own connection to the Dharma. So do that for other beings, especially those that we have right in our presence. You know, don't just play with them and do things that entertain them at that level. I mean, that's fine. You know, keeps them preoccupied, but do things that you know, influence their mind. You know, Rinpoche, when he, we're getting going to move into the whole thing of talking about um, uh, dying soon, but Rinpoche says it is our job, even when we're with humans who are dying, to protect their minds. Other people can take care of their bodies. It's our job to attend to their minds as Buddhist practitioners. So this is how we attend to their minds, is by sharing the Dharma with them in whatever ways that we can. The last form of generosity is one that's not taught maybe as often, but it's a generosity of love, which just means trying to maintain an attitude of loving kindness towards those beings in our lives so that all of our words and thoughts are infused with that so that what we say to them becomes an imparting of that loving kindness and compassion concern for them. And I don't probably need to say much more about that. Let's go on to caring for pets at the time of death and afterwards. First of all, I did want to go into a little discussion of euthanasia for pets because I know this comes up frequently and it's always a huge dilemma. And just know that there is, uh, due to the kindness of one uh, a woman who went to Rinpoche and asked Rinpoche for advice on euthanizing her own pet, that Rinpoche did a whole little expose on this. And I think I have the link to it in uh, the little handout. But know that you can go to that link and you can read Rinpoche's more precise advice. Rinpoche's never come out and said, never, ever, ever euthanize your pet. But nonetheless, he has spoken to the great benefits of if you can keep your pet alive through the death process, that it's much better in general for that to happen naturally, for that karma to kind of all get exhausted and for them to move on in that more natural way. We had a, a cat who died earlier this year and we were able to do that with him and just allow him to be with that. And it was hard. It's really hard to sit with another animal's passing, uh, another being's passing. But nonetheless, uh, it does allow things to be a bit more natural and it doesn't interrupt the whole process and make it very chaotic because I've heard stories certainly of pets that are brought to, uh, or sometimes they do come into the home, but you know, to a veterinarian that you know, administers the euthanasia, uh, the medicine to do that. And it can be very disruptive. But nonetheless, Rinpoche and his compassion and kindness gives a whole process that you can go through that to sort of entrust it 
to the Buddhas and trust it to Tara. In fact, it's green Tara that you call upon and do this little practice and let Tara make the decision for you in a sense. But then whatever decision is made, you kind of abide by that. You, know, you continue to be with that and be okay with that. Um, it's tough. I know that when we are dealing with pets that are dying, it's very hard uh, to be watching their suffering. And that's the compassionate side of it that is good. If you are going to euthanize a pet, do it with as pure a mind as possible with a concern for their suffering. I know that it gets very mixed up with our own suffering because often when we have our pets in those older stages or if they've been quite ill and they're dying from that illness, it can lead to a lot of hassle for people. They have to be tending to them and caring for them and cleaning up after them and doing so much to care for them that it can become more about us than it is about the animal. But if you do have to euthanize, you know, keep your motivation as much as possible in terms of the compassion for the suffering of that being. One teacher, though, that I had said, don't think that we know perfectly what comes after that life. As I spoke about earlier, we're going from apartment level to apartment level. We might be taking them from the animal realm where things are relatively okay, even though they're suffering as they're passing, plummeting them down to the lowest realm. We don't know. We, we simply don't have that awareness. So while we might be doing what we think is a compassionate act, it might be actually causing them to more quickly go to a state of greater suffering. So it gets quite complex, and I don't know that I can answer everybody's questions in terms of euthanasia. I really encourage you to look at Rinpoche's advice, because as I said, he doesn't say right out, don't do it. He says, you know, the various factors that we need to take into consideration, and then try to do it as skillfully as possible. So that's just a little bit on that. It's best if you can have your, your pet dying um, more naturally. However, even if your pet is being euthanized, it really helps to have once more recitation of mantras. There is a link in the document to some of the, po the powerful mantras that are used at the time of death for humans. It's the same for animals. Recite those as much as possible. Try to get familiar with them now. If you do have a pet that is sick and moving in the direction of death, try to recite mantras for them as much as possible. There's even a recording, and I do have the link to that, of Rinpoche reciting uh, some of these mantras. And so you can play those for your pet. Even if your not, pet isn't dying, you can put on those recordings when you go to work or when you're out on the beach or whatever it is that you're doing so that your pet, while it's in the home alone, is hearing mantra. You know, how wonderful. But know that uh, there are particularly some mantras that are very good uh, to hear at the time of death. Uh, certainly performing medicine Buddha practice. The medicine Buddha is said to be a very, very powerful Buddha for us uh, human beings as well as animals in terms of the time of death. And so doing that practice, and again, I've got a link to that practice in the document, uh, blessing their bodies with holy objects and written mantras. Uh, there is even like, a, I think there's a link to that where there is a page of some written mantras that should ideally be placed on the body uh, with the mantra side down uh, in the heart area of the animal um, or the human uh, and if possible uh, that goes with them when they're cremated or buried um, but blessing them with holy objects you know if we've got small statues or stupas those can be placed on the crown of the head this is said to be the more auspicious part of the body for uh, getting a good rebirth going to the higher apartment levels if you will um, so anything that we can do to try to bless the bodies of these beings most of our centers have what's called a liberation box, which is ideally made for human beings, but those things in there can be used for animals as well. Blessing cords and uh, mani pills, these small little pills that are blessed that can be put under the tongue even uh, before death or even after death uh, that can kind of bless that being. Most of our mammal pets have a similar process at death to what humans have is my understanding based on what Rinpoche has said. It's ideal if we can leave the body undisturbed for some time after the animal has stopped breathing. Now, again, it doesn't mean you have to leave it forever, but before you pick up that body and have it uh, taken for cremation or buried or whatever the case might be, do a little tug on the crown of the head, you know, on the hair that's there to try to help the consciousness to leave if it hasn't. Uh, this is said even again for humans to be a good thing to do before they, the body is moved. But again, to have as much of a, a, an environment that is supporting as many Dharma imprints as possible at the time of death from holy objects, from recitations of things, from your reciting medicine, Buddha practice and prayers. Um, to the extent to which that helps that being, I can't say. 
Rinpoche says it helps greatly, but it helps us practice compassion for those beings to not just see it as, oh, my pet died and go on with our lives. It helps us to stay connected to that being, to really want to benefit that being as well as all beings by becoming a Buddha for their sake. So at the time of death is an especially important thing, and Rinpoche does give a little bit more advice in terms of that in his document that, again, I've taken his advice as the starting point and then kind of uh, given you some other things. Um, he also talks about, you know, benefiting insects, other animals. That's kind of the last part of what was on my screen there. Um, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, caring for other animals, insects, birds, and so on. Uh, blessing them and their food with mantra recitation and holy objects if possible. You know, um, I uh, have uh, birds that I feed here every day. It's good to, first of all, again, do that putting out bird seed for those birds with bodhicitta motivation. If you want to take a few minutes to recite some mantras before, even just a minute or so to recite omani peme hong over the food and then blow on the food, before you put that bird food out, then it, it becomes blessed. And so that when they partake of it, they also become blessed. If there's a, a bird bath and they are, you know, going to partake of the water there and uh, bless that water before you put it in there or after you put it in there. Also blessing your feet in case of stepping on, on insects or other small creatures, uh, as well as your windshield, tires, and so on. There's a mantra. Let me actually pull that up on the screen here. I think I had that. Uh, yeah, that's what, what I want to share here. Um, the mantra that's at the very top of the screen there, uh, Om Kretsa Ragana Hum Hri Soha. Om Kretsa Ragana Hum Hri Soha. You say that seven times, and as it says there, then you blow on the sole of each foot or shoe. Uh, or you can even, like, what I sometimes do is just put, because it's kind of hard to blow on your foot, the bottom of your foot, but you can, like, put some saliva on your hand and blow on that, and then use the saliva as a medium to put on the bottom of your feet or on your hands. And we often kill creatures, small creatures, with our hands. So why not bless your feet or your hands so that if it comes into contact with small beings, at least they're blessed by virtue of that mantra. And then as it says in parentheses there, in addition, according to the instructions of Lama Zopa Rinpoche, one can also recite this mantra, then blow on the tires of your automobile or bicycle. And I include in that your windshield. And we drive around sometimes at high speeds and we're on freeways and stuff. And when you finish, you get this like huge coating of all these dead insects on your screen. You know, so this is a again a really uh, valuable way to have a compassionate thought towards those beings to do something that will hopefully benefit them there even used to be these um it was the mantra of Nam Gyalma that was in sort of a circle. I don't know if you guys have any of these left in your shop. We completely sold out of them. They were so popular. They're a little decal that you can put inside on the windshield so that your windshield is blessed by this mantra. And Rinpoche designed those so that people could use them to bless their windshield. We have all these ways that creatures come into our lives that we can think about ways to help them. Yeah, they're going to lose their life. It's inevitable that if you go out on the freeway and go zooming along that creatures are going to be killed under your tires, in the grill of your car, on the windshield. It's going to happen. So if you can bless your car in some way so that it has a positive effect on them, how wonderful. Of course, there was also, uh, let me put that back up, that screen that had the mantra for blessing um, the uh, meat that we eat. We're going to talk about vegetarianism and that in a moment. But if you are a meat eater, or if you're, you know, um, yeah, wanting to, um, you know, bless the food of the pets that you know, you're feeding, if the, you know, there's meat there, you could use this mantra with that even. It's Om A Bira Ke Tsara Hung. Om A Bira Ke Tsara Hung. You recite that seven times and then you blow on the meat before you eat it or before your pets eat it. This is, again, of those of you who do partake of, of meat, recognize that while you have that meat in front of you, it's an opportunity for you to connect compassionately with that being. Although the consciousness has left that being, by virtue of it having been their body, you can connect with them in that regard. You'll see, let me just go through the rest of this page of the document so that you are familiar when you get it, if you haven't received that yet. Um, there is um, the advice on euthanasia for animals with the link 
It's called Euthanasia with a Good Heart. There's perspectives on vegetarianism and eating meat that I'm going to talk about shortly. There's even some additional websites with some information about uh, the practice of compassion for animals. Um, some of the organization, uh, some things out of FPMT as well as other things that are in our world. And then these are these resources uh, that are available, including the recitations for animals that I mentioned earlier, these MP3 files, and then the Liberating Animals practice, which I'm going to talk about shortly. All right, so those are the things that, um, uh, okay, so Rebecca's got a note to you about where that's gonna come from. Good, uh, how the, you'll get that. So let's go back to the slides and kind of get grounded back again where we are there. There are, uh, again, these other animals that exist in our world that we should be concerned about to some degree and try to benefit, you know, with uh, whatever ways that we can. I even found this one little thing out on the internet. I tried to find a, a bird, bird bath like this with a Buddha or a stupa. Certainly if you want to take just a regular bird bath and put a statue or a stupa in the middle of it, that's fine, but always have them elevated. I wouldn't put the statue right in the water because it just, it's not very respectful. I mean, you notice how the Buddha is up on a platform here, sort of elevated up above, and then there's water surrounding. So the birds will come in and they'll have that kind of intimate experience with an, a holy object of Buddha. Uh, and you can, you know, bless the Buddha by saying mantras over it and putting water on it what have you so you can do your own blessing of the statue if it hasn't been blessed by another you know by some high being and then put it out for your birds to partake of so that they you know have a nice place to water and refresh themselves and they also get those imprints of those holy objects Let's go on to what I want to spend the rest of the time on, which is other issues related to animals. This first one is obviously a huge topic, vegetarianism and veganism. Uh, look at the practice of liberating animals from the danger of death. Just a brief introduction to that so that you're comfortable perhaps doing that as a very powerful way to help animals who are in danger of losing their lives. And then just a very brief few comments on animal activism. I mean, one of the things certainly, as I said earlier, vegetarianism and veganism have gotten to be much more prominent in society. So they are much, it's much easier now to live a diet in either of those categories than it has ever been, I think, in this world, and so certainly in this part of the world, in some parts of the world where you've had vegetarianism embraced from the beginning or from very early on, uh, it hasn't been so difficult. But, you know, we live in a culture in the West in particular where I was raised, you know, with meat around all the time, you know, it was part of almost every meal. And so getting away from it sometimes is difficult. But I always consider this whole thing, and I think it is important that we look at it this way, that it's sort of an evolution and that each of us has to decide for ourselves what level we are comfortable with. Even His Holiness the Dalai Lama tried to be vegetarian because he did have great concern for animals. But recall the Tibetan people are on a very high plateau where not a whole lot of stuff grows. The main crop is barley. And if you think about living your life eating only barley and sampa, which is the Tibetan version of this barley flour that they make into a variety of things, it would be probably not very nutritious for you. So they would kill yaks. They would, uh, I guess they had even people in the Muslim community who would take the lives of the yaks and they would partake of the meat of the yaks and other elements of the yaks body so that they could sustain their bodies. So His Holiness has said that his constitution based on his doctor's advice, doesn't really allow him to be 100% vegetarian. And at one point in his life, he was 50% vegetarian. Every other day he would uh, eat meat and the other days he'd be vegetarian. But, you know, in our culture, we even have this phrase, right? Meatless Mondays, I think, is something they came up with as a way of trying to encourage people to move in that direction. But I'm sure many of you have already gone to vegetarianism. I did many years ago and have found it not to be a problem at all for my constitution to be, especially with so many other products that are available now that give you a well-rounded diet to be able to live a good human life without eating meat. But then there's the step to veganism, which I haven't made completely yet. There are times when I venture into that, but I find that a little more challenging. But in any of these, we have to keep in mind the reasons why we would do this and be influenced to the degree that each of us are capable. Again, this isn't meant to be judgmental in the least, but one of the big things that's pointed out by Venerable Sangye Kadro in that little sort of uh, article that's on your uh, sheet that has a link to um, uh, to that article. She, it's sort of not a, a healthy, it's called a healthy debate. It's not much of a debate. Venerable Sangi Khadra talks about vegetarianism and its benefits. And she says that these are the things that are uh, set out by an Indian Hindu teacher, uh, His Holiness Swami uh, Chidanand uh, Saraswati. 
in his book, Drops of Nectar. He says, first of all, nonviolence. If you want to be even more committed to the path of ahimsa, then you will remove yourself from some level of violence that happens to animals by virtue of their lives being taken in order to sustain the human lives. Or again, you know, they do sustain our pets' lives, but if we can at least divorce ourselves from being a part of that process, I think it's really helpful. In fact, there is one teacher of Venerable Rabina's, and she quotes him in this article when she gives the, a bit of the opposite side of it, not completely. She doesn't say, go out and eat all the meat that you want, but she essentially says there are still some pros to looking at meat and how to work with that. But she says one of her teachers, Lati Rinpoche, said that he didn't think that you could generate compassion fully if you were still eating the bodies of other beings. And that does make some sense, right? Because it means, going back to that quote that we had from Elizabeth Fraser, uh, Fraser or Fisher, I think was her name, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Fisher. She said, you know, that we're sort of closing off a part of our hearts to do that, to be involved in the killing of other beings. So as you practice Buddhism, as you develop your own heart, there may become a time when you want to extricate yourself from that level of violence that is inflicted upon beings who contribute to our welfare. And that can be at the vegetarian level. It can be certainly even at the vegan level. This is why many vegans also avoid wearing any animal products, leather, what have you, honey, which also does cause some harm to the bees when it's harvested and so on. But keep in mind, the, sort of the caveat in all of this, Lama Zopa himself, who is vegetarian, and I think he even it became vegan at some point. I don't know that for a fact. I was able to get a confirmation, but one of my students said that they heard that Rinpoche had gone vegan, and I was like, wonderful. But Rinpoche says, it is impossible to live a human life and not be involved in the harm of other beings to some degree. You know, we have microscopic beings that live on our body. As Venerable Rabina says, it's like a zoo underneath our armpit. You know, if you had a microscope and you looked there, you'd see all these little creatures that are part of this body. This is another way when we partake of food that we can think about giving that to all of these beings, whatever that food is, making an offering to the beings that we are, that are in our gut, that are in, on, our, on our skin, in our body, on our eyelashes. I mean, they're all over the place. You know, we are sustaining a whole bunch of beings by sustaining our own bodies. So again, we can never get completely away from any sort of violence or harm to others. But this might be one thing that motivates you to move in the direction of vegetarianism or veganism. Integrity and honesty. She says here, other people kill the animal for us. They clean up the meat. They make it look nice. They give it another name even, calling it, you know, hamburger or beef or whatever. You know, and we eat it without thinking about what it really is. I mean, this is one of the things that he pointed out in Matthew Ricard in his book. There was some study that if you talk to kids and you ask them, you know, about the food that they're eating, if they're eating meat, they, 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 they can't make the connection that this is an animal that was killed because we've gotten very good at covering that all up in our society. It's a form of dishonesty to a large degree. Many of these animal activist organizations have tried to make available the film of what actually goes on in many of these places where animals are raised. And it's not a pretty picture at all. So it's a bit dishonest and lose, we lose some of our integ integrity by being a part of that you know, to some degree. Again, I'm not putting anyone down. If you're a meat eater and you feel you need to be, that's your choice. And I you know, completely respect it. But these are some of the factors that might move you in that direction. The taste of fear is a third one that's mentioned by uh, in Drops of Nectar. It says, when an animal is about to be killed, it is terrified and its body is flooded with stress hormones, which remain in the animal's tissues. Then when we eat the meat, our body also becomes filled with those hormones. This is a physical thing. The hormones are actually there. But there's also kind of an energy, if you will, with all of that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting, and, and I hate to bring this up because it's a really gruesome thing, but it, Matthew Ricard points out in this book that even in some parts of the world, they torture the animal before it is killed because they have come to the belief, probably a false belief, that the flesh of the animal will taste better if it is kind of with that sort of anxiety and fear and stress, you know, which is kind of going to the extreme of saying that this is a beneficial thing to have an animal endure that type of suffering before it's killed. In fact, it seems quite detrimental from what's said there. Of course, the big one that we'll touch on two weeks from today when we talk about ecology is the impact on the environment. You know, they say that the amount of grain and everything that it takes to feed an animal plus the you know, water, everything involved in raising it, is huge compared to how much grain could actually feed human beings and other beings in this world. You know, so we are 
exhausting the resources of this planet by having an animal agricultural industry. And that includes both things that are byproducts of animals as well as eating the meat of animals. So again, that is also something that I'm not gonna be able to talk about fully today, but as you do your own discovery of this, uh, and we'll talk about it in two weeks from today when we talk about the environment, this can be something that, I actually do have two students up in Taos, a couple who made the decision after watching this film, Cowspiracy, that's all about how the animal industry is contributing so greatly to the harm to the environment. They became vegan right then. It wasn't a moralistic thing for them other than the impact on the environment. Yeah, so, And then health is one of the things that's mentioned as well. In general, doctors are finding that it is healthier to have a diet with less meat, if not completely without meat. So again, I'm not saying that you can't have people who live very, very long lives and relatively healthy who've eaten meat all their lives. I think my, uh, I've heard many stories, my family's from Wisconsin, where there's a lot of meat eating and cheese and all this sort of stuff. And many of my relatives live very, very long and had relatively healthy lives. So there's no absolute on any of this. But know that that can also be a factor sometimes that influences people to move in that direction. One last thing on ve uh, vegetarianism, veganism is what Venerable Rabina talks about, is eating meat equivalent to killing an animal. They are two separate actions, according to the teaching she's you know, pursued and, and come to the conclusion of. And we have to say that when you, if you were to sit down and eat a hamburger, you do not have the intention to kill. You didn't generate the intention to kill. And that is what constitutes an act of killing, is to have the intention to take a life of a being. You are sitting down with maybe other delusion going on, maybe a great attachment to the taste of that meat and so on, and maybe you know uh, furthering your desire, but you're not killing. You're not doing uh, having a mind of killing. So there is a separate karma, but what the karma of eating meat is is very. Again, it depends upon a lot of different factors. They say the best thing is to not kill or not to eat anything that was killed specifically for you like those restaurants where you come in and you choose the lobster in the tank that is going to be served to you. Not a good idea, they say, because it's like you are, you are then the instrument of saying, kill this being for me. Then you're much closer to that action of killing. But nonetheless, you know, we have gotten into it the way that we, our society runs the meat industry. We're very removed from the actual killing that is taking place in these slaughterhouses and so on. Karmically, there's a great distance, but that doesn't mean you're completely free of all of that but it isn't the identical karma. Nonetheless, again, something that people as Buddhists do struggle with to some degree. So don't feel guilty if you are a meat eater. Don't you know, beat yourself up. Maybe try to eat less meat. Uh, some teachers say to eat the meat of larger animals because that larger animal fed many, many people. Whereas if you are eating shrimp, you know, or uh, escargot or something, you know, where you have to eat a lot of them to constitute a meal, well, then you've killed many, many creatures for the sake of you know, your own uh, sustenance. So these are things to keep in mind in regard to that. Uh, let's go back to the screen and see what we have else, the other topics, practice of liberating animals from the danger of death. This is a practice that has been done many, many, many uh, years as far as I know. Rinpoche was right, quite keen on this and has encouraged centers to do this, individuals to do this, particularly if you want to remove obstacles to your long life, because it's said to be very powerful to take animals who are in danger of losing their lives and help them to be free from that danger. Now, what are those animals? I mean, sure, sure it would be great if you could go to some uh, ranch where cows are being raised to become beef and say, I'm going to take one of these cows and buy them from you and keep a cow uh, safe from danger so that it never has to be killed for its meat. Well, then you have to raise a cow, right? You have to have the land for it and you have to have the money to take care of it and all the things that are involved in it. It's challenging. It's a wonderful thing to do. And we do have uh, an animal liberation sanctuary in Nepal where many creatures are brought, goats and what have you, who were rescued from various farms and they can live out their lives surrounded by holy objects and Rinpoche comes to visit a cave Occasionally and what have you. How wonderful, but most of us don't have land and the opportunity to do that. So we have to probably aim for smaller creatures. I know in places like Singapore, where you've got a port there, they often, you know, uh, go down and get the, the live animals that are being sold in many of the markets, fish and what have you, and they release them into the ocean. Of course, many of those sometimes get caught back up by fisher, fisher people, and then they bring them back to the market and they have to keep releasing them. 
one of the things that I find really uh, easy to do, uh, especially here in New Mexico, uh, though you don't want to, you have to watch the time of year when you're doing it, is to release earthworms. Earthworms, as you know, are raised in these farms and put into little small containers to be used as bait for people who go fishing. Well, you're kind of interrupting that process to some degree as well. If you can get to the store, I know Walmart has huge cases of them. And so it's kind of hard to go in there and buy them all up, but they're not that much. You get like 25 worms for three or four bucks and you can take them all and give them a new home. But liberating animals from the danger of death doesn't mean simply that. It doesn't mean simply I'm gonna take all these worms, the, all these earthworms and put them in my compost pile in the backyard or put them in my garden or whatever the case might be. It means that we take an advantage once more while those beings are in our presence to do something beneficial for them. And this is where you do something similar to what I mentioned earlier. You set up a, 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 a holy object shrine in the middle of a room and you walk the animals around them, circumambulate that. You say prayers and practices in their presence. You blow on water after reciting mantras and put a little bit of the water into the containers before you liberate them. You do everything you can to imprint in the minds of those earthworms or crickets or whatever it is. Some people release crickets because they sell crickets at pet shops for lizards and things like that. You do everything that you can to make sure that when those animals get released, you've put some positive imprint on on their minds. You've generated some compassionate connection with them. So the practice of liberating animals is once more towards the end of that document that uh, you're going to be sent. And you can download that. It even has within it um, the instructions on making what they, they used to sell these in the FPMT store. They're called um, kind of animal liberation tools. And you sort of put your hands into these little plastic things and you use them to scoop up animals that come into your house. You know, and so say a spider comes in and you kind of scoop the spider up with that into the other one so that the two come together. And then you can take it and shake it down to the bottom and then you go and you take it and put it outside. On top of it are all these wonderful mantras that Rinpoche designed to go on top of here. You can even say mantras into the spider before you release it. So you can do a little mini animal liberation practice by building these little things for yourself, a left and a right one so that you can kind of do that work. It, the instructions on doing that, of course, you can't make them as durable as these because these are nice hard plastic. But you can make them out of cardboard uh, according to the instructions that are in this lib anim Liberating Animals book. Again, the physical book, I'm not sure it's available. Uh, I don't think it's available through the foundation store anymore, but the download of all of this is out there. So this is a practice that's really, really valuable to do. So I'm just about done with my time here, but let me go back to the screen and talk about one more thing very briefly, which is animal activism. I can't tell you, you know, that you need to do this. I think we each have to once more, just like with vegetarianism and veganism, decide to what extent we want to become advocates for the beings in this world that we share this world with. And some of you may do it on a much smaller scale. Maybe you do it around, you know, um, uh, the Humane Society that works with pets and pets that are abused and what have you. Or maybe you join uh, pet, PETA. PETA, I don't I never know how to pronounce it, I think it's PETA, uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And you try to work from that vantage point because they do things around animals that are used in laboratory experiments and all this other sort of stuff. Um, find what works for you, but know that this is part of our responsibility, I feel, on this planet to kind of have the voice for those who don't have a voice, to be sure that those who need protection once more in terms of giving the generosity of pr protection from harm, helping other beings to not have to experience more harm in their lives. In regard to that, I'm going to go forward here, is uh, animal activism is a very short quote from Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall says, what you do makes a difference. And you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So this is really the gist of it for animal activism. I don't have a really you know, broad array of things that I could talk about even in regard to it, but most of you know many of the organizations that are out there. And you can see even certainly just research and even see what's locally going on. Helping out a shelter in your area is a wonderful way to be uh, an animal advocate. So this is what I'm going to end with today before we kind of open it up to see if there are any quick questions is this wonderful quote from His Holiness. You know, our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. I mean, this is the essence of our compassion is to do what we can to help, but at least do our best not to hurt them. 
Okay, wow, that was a lot to fit into the time that I had, but I did it somehow. Any questions or comments from anybody? What if I have a guest that doesn't eat anything but meat? Um, I have a guest coming to our house uh, and he's 100% carnivore. <laughs> Is there a mantra I can recite to minimize the consequences of the act of serving meat to someone? Yeah, I think it would be good to go ahead and recite that mantra that I have about blessing meat and any of the other mantras, uh, the a mantra of Chen Rezig, uh, Buddha of Compassion, Amani Pe Me Hong, Medicine Buddha Mantra. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. I mean, do, maybe there, if your friend is okay with you doing that and sort of maybe blowing on the meat or something. Now in the days of COVID-19, I'm not sure people are going to be that hip on you blowing on their food. But maybe, you know, you find a way to um, uh, put a little bit of water in a, in a glass and then maybe blow on that and then maybe just sprinkle a little bit of water on the meat before you cook it or, or uh, after. I don't know. I mean, I think it, we have to just be conscious of if people are going to see what we're doing, you don't want to turn people off. I mean, that's one of the, the, the best or you know, the most important things that we always have to pay attention to. And that's why even though Lama Zopa Rinpoche is vegetarian, he doesn't make the statement that all of our centers have to be vegetarian. You know, everyone who comes to the, the Buddha Dharma has to be vegetarian. He, we don't want to make those kinds of things because we don't want to turn people off. So this person who's coming, if they won't be turned off by you doing these various things and doing what you can to help bless the... So you, if they're open to it, if they've got some Buddhist inkling, well, maybe you can share the mantra with them and you can say, oh, there's this mantra I learned that you can bless this meat before you eat it and think about the being who lost its life for the sake of you to eat it. And you can learn it and recite it with me. Maybe that'll be a good way, but it really depends upon who that is. But absolutely, you know, do something for that being and for that person who you're feeding it to. Um, another comment, uh, we have to use animals for medical usage. I was uh, very sick. They knew what to do because they had used animals for research. I mean, this is true. I mean, we, we do benefit human lives by virtue of what happens in laboratories with animals. But again, as you're partaking of that medicine, bring to mind those beings, any beings that were lost their lives or were wounded, injured, had to suffer by virtue of that. Try to keep that in mind so that we kind of feel the karmic debt of that, that beings contributed to our welfare by virtue of them being in the laboratory. And I have a dear friend um, who ran, um, she continues to run a wildlife sanctuary in Texas, in Kendrick, Texas, which is outside of Houston. And she, um, uh, she tells me these stories about how like she'll get a call from one of these laboratories that has these monkeys that had like metal plates put into their head and they'll ask her they'll say you know uh before we give deliver them to you so they can live their lives at your sanctuary do you want us to remove the metal plate and she's like of course i want you to remove the metal plate no creature wants to live the rest of its life with a metal plate in its head that's not necessary but anyway she she told me once that she thinks animals are here in this world to teach us compassion. I mean, it's a nice way to look at it, to see that even when we do have animals whose lives maybe are injured or uh, taken away so that we could have the medical research, recognize that they've contributed to that. Feel some compassion for them because they've been used in that way. Um, and another comment I do believe from Marta. Hi, Marta. I do believe Olive meditates with me. Every time I meditate, she lays and stays very still. She's also been blessed by Geshe Sherab. She seems to respect my altar or our altar, and she loves mantras. Maybe it's my imagination, but I see it in, it every time. I think that, you know, we can see this, is that animals become a bit more respectful of all of that. They get some of the imprints from that. How wonderful that Geshe Sherab's uh, blessed her. So uh, Rebecca says, no, we don't have to use animals in labs anymore. They're incredible technological advances. I mean, it is true. I don't know much about that whole field of, you know, laboratories and what have you. I'm sure there are still places, and even now I'm hearing, you know, in terms of the vaccinations for COVID-19, that they have done some animal trials on things and are exposing animals, uh, primates and what have you. Um, they're also doing human trials on this, so too. I mean, so yes, there are a lot of medical advances, but I don't know if we've gone completely to the place where we, you know, can avoid all laboratory animals. Um, Faye says, hi, Don, sorry, I missed the story about the power of holy objects. I heard something about cow dung and flies. <laughs> Could you repeat the short story again? Yeah, the, the story is that there was one of these stupas. I mean, most of you know what a stupa is. It's sort of a reliquary. Um, I don't have one here on my, oh, I do have a glass one. Here's a little glass one. 
uh, crystal one. Um, this doesn't contain a reliquary or relics or anything, but it's symbolic of the enlightened mind of the Buddha. Well, the story goes that there was one of these stupas, a huge one, and there was a lot of rain that had come, so it was all water around the stupa. And there was a, f uh, a pile of cow dung that was floating on the top of the water, and a fly landed on it. And while he was eating, the cow dung floated around the stupa. <laughs> And this is why we do circumambulations of these holy objects. It's said to be very powerful to do circumambulations. You always, uh, generally you have it, the object to your right. So you're circumambulating clockwise. And so anyway, this fly went around maybe once, twice, three times. I don't know how many times. And this being through its omniscience saw that there, was, there were incredible seeds planted at that time when this occurred because of the power of the holy object, because of this object, the stupa that represents the enlightened mind of the Buddha. You know, and it was blessed by maybe even housing the relics of various Buddhas or what have you, because these, um, the stupas that are out in the out at large are really huge and have a lot of these things in them. But you know, if you have these holy objects, then expose your animals to them because it's got that same sort of power to plant some seeds uh, to be able to uh, ripen in the future. Um, regarding using animals for research depends on whether one believes his, her, their life is more valuable than an animal's. You know, this is one of the things that was pointed out earlier by Norm Phelps is that we're not talking about devaluing any particular being, that they're all equal in some way. Nonetheless, we do have to say that the human life, because of the human potential, does have great value. And there may be times where we do have to sacrifice the, an animal life for the sake of a human life. It shouldn't be something we do very lightly. But nonetheless, if we see that there's great value to continuing to have my human life um, to be able to benefit others, to continue to work on my mind, while I've got this existence where I've met with the Dharma and have all this opportunity, it does make some sense then to you know, have that. I mean, my brother is facing some things around possibly needing a... a his aortic valve is having problems. It's supposed to have three flaps and they found it just has two and he's going to be getting it replaced. And he's got some issues about whether they're going to put a pig valve in there um, because of some ethical things that he has. And the other alternative is the synthetic valve, which doesn't last as long and can deteriorate. But the pig valve would be very effective and for a fairly long time. You know, so he may need to make a decision and any one of us might face that at some point in our lives to say, is my life and what would happen to an animal by virtue of me needing some part of them or some of them to be involved in research or whatever for me to be able to continue to have my life, try to once more keep the motivation as other oriented as possible. I want to be able to engage in that treatment so that I can benefit. Even if we look at antibiotics, right? They're called antibiotics because they are against life. They kill living things that are in our system. And when they go in to kill a harmful thing that's in our system that's living, they kill all the other living things too. That's why we need probiotics. You can kill a lot of beings by that. But if you are ill enough that you need to take that in order to continue to have your life, then think about those beings. Even bless that medicine before you take it. Blow mantra on it so that hopefully you've got a compassionate motivation to taking away the lives of those beings so you can continue to have your life. Um, then to tag on to Rebecca's comments, uh, Peta has 10 science uh, to tag has 10 science to tag on Rebecca's comment, uh, or 10 scientists available to facilitate not using animals for experimentation, or 10 kind of scientific facts or things, you know, or 10 science, oh, I guess they loan the scientists, that's the point of it, I'm not picking it up completely, but do they loan these scientists to uh, be involved in experimentation so that they can make sure that it's done ethically without any, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, if, yeah, yeah is that I can, I can, respond to that I, I, I'm, I follow them I think they they acknowledge the fact that it is you know a challenge that needs to be tackled but you know it's better to work towards it and collaborate with other corporations mm -hmm. just to figure it out rather than just to say oh well it is what it is you know we can still to work towards yeah. it and you know, they talk oh. about creating synthetic frogs to facilitate those science experiments instead of actually using real frogs mm -hmm. so yeah. It's a work in progress, I think. No, and thanks for bringing that up. And, and on this whole topic, one thing I also want to emphasize is, is your dollars, by virtue of what you choose to purchase, does make a difference. It does make a difference in terms of what you choose to buy. So look for products that 
aren't tested on animals, particularly cosmetics. A lot of cosmetics, they do incredible harm to animals that are so unnecessary. You know, there are many products out there that don't and look for, they'll have it on the label. If they care enough to do it, then they care enough to make sure people know that. And by your supporting those businesses that do that, you make a conscious choice. You're voting to, you know, have businesses be sustainable by choosing not to have animals involved in their research of these various products. But again, in cosmetics, it's a lot. So, um, but anyway, I, I, these are touching on a lot of these topics. I appreciate everyone bringing this in that I didn't have kind of, you know, as part of the agenda of looking at it, but it naturally comes up, you know. Uh, go to uh, PETA, to uh, PETA.org, and as someone, uh, Marianne says, or thanks, Marianne, a list of those products that are, um, marketed and developed without any animal harm and uh, animal testing. Um, so going back to just kind of summarizing this all up, thank you again so much for all of your comments and everything, but um, I think it really is important that each of us once more make some decision about making, first of all, the commitment to practicing compassion in this way. We see it as, again, an extension of our compassion to our human uh, brethren and sistren, and we move out to that world of the animals, and we make sure that there's a consistency in our practice from what we do in our daily life to, you know, the choices we make to how we work with our pets, everything, that it's all being motivated by bodhicitta and by compassion. And then we just let that unfold. And as I said, for each of us, we have to make our own conscious decisions about how to do that. If you are a meat eater, then make sure that you do something to help that animal that produced that meat. If you aren't, then rejoice that you haven't engaged in killing that or in any part of that being being killed, but know that there are many beings that are killed to produce your vegetables. So we always have to have this sphere of compassion, of thinking about how we are interconnected with so many other beings and benefit from their activities and their lives. And then we will fill a very rich life at the end of all of this because we will have used the opportunity we have in this human life with the animal world around us to develop our hearts, to increase uh, our awareness and our practice of morality. So let's just do a couple of prayers, uh, one particular prayer to conclude with. Um, this is a prayer that... Um, uh, Venerable Tendron had on her sheet as well. So I know you guys are familiar with it. The wonderful prayer from Master Shanti Deva, this dedication verse. Uh, and then we'll recite the prayers for our precious teachers. Uh, but as we recite this, think about all the beings we're holding in our hearts, as well as all beings everywhere, especially all these animals that are cohabitating this planet with us, uh, thinking about all of them being the recipients of the merit we've created so they can be free from suffering and find true happiness. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of our merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness, and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid, and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power, and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may we too abide to dispel the misery of the world. Then the prayers for these two teachers, as we recite this, think we're creating the causes for all spiritual guides to have good health and long lives. The wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunas victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplished magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, Savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. 
once more, thank you all. I enjoyed this today. I always enjoy going back to some of these topics I haven't taught in a while. So it helps me to kind of do a little bit of additional work and to uh, have some things to hopefully share with you that are useful. So please, I encourage you to use whatever we talked about today in your own life. And uh, if you can, uh, to benefit others through that. So, all right. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Don. This has Thanks, been wonderful. Thanks, Don. Good to see thank you. you all. And thank you all for coming. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, it's so good to see so many of you. Bye. Bye.